So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our next, next speaker. So before, I don't think you need further introduction because we are so well known, but I'd like to quote something that I wrote, uh, I saw last week, and, then, and you made me think of, of that last night in the, in the ceremony that we had. So last week, Pope Francis was tweeting something like this. So I, he was asking us, are you in a position of authority? And so be holy by working for the common good. So, so by giving up your time and, and energy to organize this conference, I think you are definitely following Pope Francis' you know, words. So thank you so much, Jack. Uh, thank you, everybody. First of all, Cardinal Turkson, uh, your prologue to our um, conference this morning, I think, is just so fitting that it gives us all new words to sort of live by as we speak, uh, each of us in our own more or less uh, disciplines that we are sort of expertise, expertise in. So before I talk, I, I thank uh, Ram for making this uh, presentation. Uh, he, he did this video, and I was uh, assigned myself to pinch hit. I know I can't do as good a job, but um, I want to start off with, with the fact that, whoops, uh, let's see. That's the laser pointer. Which one am I looking for? This one. Okay. Uh, Ram and I go back uh, more than 40 years, and we published a paper in uh, 1979. I, I published it with, with Paul Crutzen and Ram and myself. Uh, I had done work on the distribution of tropospheric ozone, so that was my contribution. Ram had the radiative transfer model. Paul, of course, put everything together and said, you guys work together and, and let's write a paper. And uh, actually, either one of us could have been first author. We flipped a coin, Ram won, so I became first author. Um, <laughs> shortly thereafter, we all left to our own, own different places. Um, I went to NASA Langley Research Center, which no one ever heard of until the movie Hidden Figures. Um, Ramanathan started the center for the C4 Center, the Center for Clouds, Climate, and Chemistry. And Paul went on to the uh, Max Planck Institute of Chemistry. They went on to become extremely you know, prestigious scientists. Uh, Crutzen won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1995. Ram won the title of one of the champions of the planet from the United Nations. I went on to become playing softball at NASA on the infamous Barfly science team. So I got my dream. I got to play shortstop wearing a St. Louis Cardinals hat. Okay. <laughs> but let's get serious, sort of. Um, we have this figure, I'm sure everybody has seen it, is what sort of started the whole discussion, is where, where is this increase in carbon dioxide coming from? And it was obtained by uh, Charles David Keeling, who had a hypothesis that indeed the Earth is breathing and that you should be able to see its respiratory uh, imprint or footprint. If we go somewhere, well, he saw this at Scripps, which is where he was in California, but he had trees nearby. So uh, Keeling said, we've got to go somewhere that's totally removed from, from any kind of uh, habitation. And I guess he was pretty smart because he said, let's go to Hawaii and make these measurements in the free atmosphere. So he set up the Mauna Loa Observatory. And the idea behind it was that he was going to um, substantiate his hypothesis by looking at the annual cycle of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And he proved that. And he had two years of funding from, I think it was NSF. I was part of the International Geophysical Year in 1958. But the second year of measurements, there was this discrete difference. And he, being the super scientist that he was, was very upset by the fact that there was seen to be this increase. Now, the story goes that he actually funded himself for a couple years to see if, indeed, his instrument was incorrect or if maybe there is a trend. Well, indeed, there is this trend, and this is now what's commonly called as the Keeling curve. And we couple this with going back not just to the 1950s from the ambient air samples, but from ice cores we can look at carbon dioxide and the fact that if you go back 400,000 years or even longer and derive concentrations of CO2, 
even in relatively warm times, called the interglacial times, the concentration never exceeds 280. But you see this periodicity uh, that is totally um, a result, or primarily a result, of, of the uh, orbital mechanics of, of the Earth. And these are called the Milankovitch cycles. So there is a periodicity. You can see it very well. Uh, subsequently, we've been able to use proxy measurements to look at, at um, temperature, looking at radioactive tracer of, of oxygen-18, the isotope. But this is the point I want to draw your attention to. The last 12,000 years, we've lived in a very stable climate. Now, man has been on the planet even since before then, but things really started to change about 12,000 years ago in what's called the Holocene. And as you can see, there is a uh, very steady climate. Even prior to that, um, you can see jagged changes in, t in temperature. But something happened here. And what has happened is that the climate remained very stable and civilization was able to develop. So about 11,000 years ago, the invention of agriculture came. And because of that, we no longer became ha uh, hunters and gatherers within the the anthrop within the, uh, the mankind, the natural inhabitant. But we were able to grow food, we were able to develop uh, civilizations and, and exchange, et cetera, et cetera. But now we look at that Holocene cycle, which uh, on a larger time scale shows up here. But now we blow that up, the last 160,000 years. We're still within that realm of that range of, of uh, natural variability. But you know, look what's happened in the last um, 150 years or so. So at that time, when we started to see this difference, okay, Paul Crutzen wrote a paper in 2002 that says, geologically, we're in a new era, or epoch. I'm not a geologist, so I get those words confused. But um, we're no longer, he proposed, no longer in the Holocene because we see this vast difference uh, that was not natural. Uh, he called it the Anthropocene. And he said that it probably started with the onset of the Industrial Revolution, somewhere around the turn of the 19th century. But something very unusual started to happen post-World War II. And it's called the Great Acceleration. Now, if you look at the encyclical, uh, Pope Francis calls this the rapidification, basically. But what you, what you see is that all of these, this driver in, in CO2 shows up in many, many variables, including uh, gross national product, uh, the interconnectability the, um, of, of um, communication in the world. So something has changed. So we're entering the era of the Anthropocene, and it is indeed this era of the Anthropocene that is driving the uh, saying that the, that the forces of mankind are now dominant insofar as controlling many of the, the processes taking place on the planet. Okay, so I want to get into a little bit of definition. I want to look at climate versus weather, but primarily climate, and this is what we have to remember, is that climate is a distribution, the average distribution, so we can look at what the climate has been over the past hundred years or so or whatever. And we realize, of course, that on a day-to-day -day basis, we have deviations from that climate, the average conditions. And that's just the way natural systems behave. So this figure here is what really convinced me that something is happening on this planet that uh, is, is significant. Normally, you would have a, uh, a, a bell-shaped curve, that's what it's called here, with an average distribution. This is the old climate in the blue. The new climate, in addition to making things warmer, okay, which is sort of, odd, you know, that's, that's sort of what we've, what we've observed over the past 150 years or so, actually much more recently in just the last two or three decades. But the distribution follows a new bell-shaped curve. And when the uh, curve is flatter like this, what you're doing now is increasing its variability. And that's what I want to get into for the rest of the, this talk. So not only are we changing the average, we're also changing the variability so that we now have more extreme events in such a way that they're even more extreme than they would have been under a natural climate. And it's this figure in particular that was really most eye-opening to me as I was teaching a, a course on climate, which I had never really taught before before I came here to St. Louis U. 
Um, the observations of temperature show it follows a nice bell-shaped curve. You can see the curve in it sort of bunched around a given temperature. And now we're looking just at the region in, in Europe, okay? We developed these climate models. The climate models looking at the observations from 1961 to 1990, where we assume that there's very little impact of artificial global warming on this natural system. It also follows a, a, follows a bell-shaped curve. But then in 2003, in Europe, it was unprecedentedly hot. I mean, look at how much of an outlier 2003 is. Now, Ron went into looking at model predictions, and this is what really opened my eyes. When I look at these simulations for this region of the world for the last three decades of this century, this is what the average temperatures look like, such that the unheard of summer of 2003 more or less becomes the norm, okay? So this really opened my eyes, assuming the models are correct. The models aren't perfect, but they're perfect, they're good enough that, that the, I truly believe this result. Whoops. Okay. So this one heat wave in, in 2003 uh, was in Europe. It resulted in 10,000 deaths, or I'm sorry, more than 40,000 deaths. And there was another one in 2010. And this is what, what the uh, heat pattern looked like in France and, and Germany. I actually was visiting Paul in Germany uh, during this heat wave, and it was un unprecedentedly hot. It was, he didn't have air conditioning, and I remember having to stay on the third floor, and it was warm. So um, I remember this very well. Uh, a few years later, we had this incredible amount of burning taking place, I'm sorry, of heat in Russia, and this resulted in the fact that this is what Moscow looked like. Moscow is here. There are far fires all over Siberia. So this sort of gets to Ram's point, okay? There's not just um, heat effects you have to worry about, okay? But all the ancillary uh, activity that may happen because of global warming. And, you know, we look at Russia in 2010. I don't know if Donald Trump was there or not. But um, we have to think also, we, we experienced something similar to that in California just this past fall and early winter. People had to wear uh, gas masks and, and, and masks in general. And... The burning wasn't right there in Moscow. These are coming from thousands of kilometers away. Another interesting uh, uh, analysis, this is the analysis now, uh, that leads to, has led to a long-term drought in uh, the Near East and Syria in particular. And it is believed by many people that this long-term drought in this region between, uh, that's a mis, uh, this is 1971, this should have been I think 2002, sorry about that. But you, you can see that these drought conditions have uh, persisted for a long time. That eventually leads to civil unrest because food can't grow, uh, people have to migrate. We experienced something like this in, in this country in the 1930s, and uh, we called it the Dust Bowl. Our the people who lived there were able to go west to California and find a new life. They didn't have to go into another country. So. These kinds of, of uh, phenomena in, in the climate records uh, are not totally unknown, uh, but because of the sensitive situation in the Mideastern countries, civil war has broken out and, of course, more war. So it's, it's all sort of related. Um, and Ram showed this figure, basically, that it is predicted using the models in the future that this will be an even... Uh, this, this region will continue to be in, in a lot of, lot of droughts, so the unrest may continue. Okay. Another thing we've experienced this past year is, is hurricanes, more intensity in hurricanes. So again, I'm going to look, show you a model result that looks at, uh, this is a meteorological term, the, the lower the pressure, the more intense the hurricane. So you run the simulation over, and this is with nine models running the simulations. The average hurricane uh, central pressure is in this region right here, still somewhat, and it's looking at major hurricanes. You run the same model on increased carbon dioxide, and you can see that climatologically, we're going to have more intense hurricanes, okay? But th this is not surprising. I mean, we look at the heat content of the ocean. It's really increased if you look at these last 50 years or so. There's a lot more heat in the, in the ocean, it, no doubt a lot more energy. And the other thing that's exasperating the damage that's caused by hurricanes is the fact that sea level is rising. These are all data. So you have a, a higher sea level, these waves 
become larger, the coasts become more susceptible to more damage. Uh, a result of that is, is something like what we saw this past year in, um, uh, in 2017, where it was by far the most uh, disastrous uh, hurricane season uh, that's ever been recorded, okay? 2005, which had Katrina, is surpassed by 2017. And of course, I think you have to estimate looking at these other ones because they've tried to adjust all this stuff for in 2017 dollars, but no doubt 2017 uh, is recorded as the worst hurricane season on record. Would we have had these many hurricanes if we didn't have uh, the global warming? Maybe, but the probabilities are increased. And the last point I'm going to get to is the change in the weather. And real briefly, what, what's happened because the warming that we've observed is more, uh, has occurred more in the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere, we've actually changed the mean position of the jet stream. Um, because of the jet stream, because you, the, ther the um, uh, jet stream is, is called a thermal wind, and it basically transports the more heat in the lower levels to the uh, higher latitudes, in the process you generate storms. But what we see is that because of the less thermal gradient, the jet stream in general has become weaker. When it becomes weaker, it has a, a tendency for the meridional component, the north-south component, to become stronger, and it becomes stationary. The net result is something like that, and this is showing the relationship between the fact that uh, the resonance of these uh, waves has really increased between 2010 and 1980, and it correlates remarkably well with how much ice is melting, which in turn lowers the, or in, yeah, lowers the albedo at high latitudes, which in turn causes more warming, which in turn reduces that gradient between the tropics and higher latitudes. And this is an example of, of what happened in 2015. We had record cold temperatures in some areas in 2015 for the entire month. Well, it's because one of these waves got stuck in a position so that all this cold air could come down and uh, infiltrate the eastern U.S. Conversely, two years later in 2017, we experienced record warmth. So this is all because of the general change in the behavior of the jet stream and the storm systems that are developed. Now, there are some in this country who believe that when you have a really cold episode like this, it means global warming cannot occur. And this is Senator uh, in Inhofe, who, before his Senate colleagues brought in a snowball and said, we hear that 2014 was the warmest year on record, but this is a snowball. And I got it just outside here, so it's very cold. Okay, so this disproved global warming. And unfortunately, it's this kind of stuff that gets perpetuated. Uh, and if we look at the, the ice uh, over a longer period of time, now we have good records uh, going back, uh, the, the glaciologists have studied that. You can see it certain, has certainly happened in the last uh, 50 years or so. And then one, one last uh, example here is the fact that when you look at the jet stream and you look at its impact now of being stationary and deeper, and we compound that with higher sea level and we compound that with warmer um, temperatures feeding into the to, uh, cyclogenesis or hurricane genesis, we had the unique position of Hurricane uh, Sandy in 2012, which caused uh, unheard of flooding, and it also produced two feet of snow, snow uh, up in the, uh, in the mountainous areas. So things are happening. Things may have happened before, but they certainly are going to be less. They're going to be happening more frequently now, uh, greater damage insofar as the extreme events. And I go back to, to Ram's uh, last statement, is that, you know, there are things that are going to happen, and it's not just the fact that we're talking about weather and climate. There's going to be more people exposed to deadly heat, to, to various diseases, to more droughts. And he was talking about a, a temperature increase of only about 2%, 2 degrees Celsius. And last but not least, as he put it, you know, even if this is only 5% chance of really happening, would you fly on an airplane with um, less than 95% chance of getting to your, to your destination. So uh, fortunately, we sort of experienced that with uh, Cardinal Turkson, but not because of, of anything doing with climate. Um, so thank you for your time. I think I, I don't know how long. Yeah, I'm OK, I'm right for time. So Rodrigo, we'll have discussion after uh, 
Dr. Mock and, and, and Professor Molino finish. <laughs>